you so much for joining us tonight. It's an honor to have you with us for this evening's Climate Science AMA with none other than our wonderful advisory board member, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe. And I know for those of you that are joining that haven't heard much about Citizens Climate Lobby before, we'll go over just a, uh, two slides on who we are for one minute. For those that haven't had a chance to connect with Citizens Climate Lobby before tonight and finding out about uh, Dr. Hayhoe's participation with us, we're a nonprofit national grassroots organization, one of the largest focused on building bipartisan efforts on the federal level for climate solutions in the United States. We have a path to success and a roadmap to be effective with national climate policy. And we provide you as volunteers with specific next steps to take with action opportunities to help make a difference every day in your volunteering with Citizens Climate Lobby. We have chapters across this country. We always look forward to starting new ones and we really appreciate your interest if you'd like to get more involved after tonight. And to do that, well, we have a weekly informational session that you can go to by visiting cclusa.org forward slash intro. And we also would love to tell you a bit more about the Energy Innovation Act, the legislation that we have helped form and are supporting at the federal level, the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. And we have a wonderful website with more information all about that. Uh, but without further ado, let's get to the heart of the matter. Tonight we joined to find out more about Dr. Hayhoe. So let me give a quick biography update and then I'll pass the baton to our esteemed speaker this evening. Dr. Hayhoe is an atmospheric scientist whose life work has been dedicated to discovering and communicating the realities of a change of climate to those who will be affected most by it. As a professor in the Department of Political Science and the director of the Climate Science Center at Texas Tech University, I can speak personally to Catherine developing new ways to quantify the potential impacts of human activities at the regional scale. She's been involved with Citizens Climate Lobby from a very early time. She's helped us in Texas and throughout the larger uh, national movement that we're building. And she served as lead author for the US National Climate Assessment and also hosts a pretty amazing series on PBS Digital called Global Weirding. I'll also put a, a link to that in the chat. And uh, her bio can go on and on, but I'll just highlight that uh, her leadership has led her to being named as Times one of the most 100 most influential people, Foreign Policy's 100 leading global thinkers, and Fortune 50's world's greatest leaders. So with that, we are so honored to have you join us tonight. Thank you. So we're going to do something a little bit different tonight. Uh, for those of you who already sent in questions or are typing stuff in the window, that's totally fine. But if you don't mind, I would like to do this because we can do this together. And when you ask questions this way, you can also upvote the questions you want me to answer. We might not have time to answer everybody's questions, but by upvoting them, we can get to the questions that the most people want answers to. So how do you do this? Well, you're probably already on your phone or on a computer. So if you're on a computer, you can just pick up your phone, and do this on your phone, or you can do it in a different window. I want you to go to pollev.com. That's P-O-L-L-E-V.com. I put the link in the Q&A window too, so you can click on it there. And it will ask you to enter something, enter Texas Tech, all one word, no caps, Texas Tech. And it might ask you your name, don't worry about that. We don't need a name. Once you've done that, you will see the very first question and you can vote. This is just to get you started. See, I'm asking you questions too. You don't just get to ask me questions. All right, uh, we have one person who candidly admits to not waking up until noon, but so far it looks like coffee is the winner for the beverage of choice in the morning. We have some tea, oh, water's coming to the fore. Nobody drinks juice anymore, eh? Nobody drinks juice, okay. Coffee, it's an evening out. Oh, water's coming up a little bit. Oh, tea, yes, tea's surging to a late lead. Us tea drinkers, it may take us a little while to get our fingers ready, but once they're there, we can go. All right, so my answer actually to this would be tea. Um, I am a huge tea fan. I prefer black tea, but I have all different types of black tea. I usually keep at least, probably at least six or seven different types around the house, and I'm always looking to try new ones. All right. Now, the next question is going to be a little bit harder. Ready? Where are you tuning in from? For this, you have to either touch or click on the map. 
oh, a lot of you are very fast. Now, being from Canada, I'm very sensitive about this. So if you are from Canada, you can actually click off the map. So just imagine where you are, and you can even go over to Asia and Europe too. Just click off the map. You don't have to click right on the map. So it looks like we have a good distribution from Texas. Yay. We also have, oh, we have somebody, it looks like from Vancouver Island maybe, as long as your finger was accurate. Um, we've got a good representation from California. We've got Illinois and either Northern Illinois or Wisconsin, a bunch from the Northeast, one from Florida, um, Oregon, Washington State, Dakota. Okay, nobody from Alaska and nobody from the whole middle of the country. All right, so next question. Don't worry, we'll get to your question soon. Next question. I wanna ask you this, and this time you have to answer with a word. If you need to use more than one word, put a dot between your words. So either one word, or if you want to use more than one word, put a dot between your words. When it comes to climate change, I am most concerned about what? What are you most concerned about when it comes to climate change? There you go. Put a dot in between your words. Perfect. So we've got, wow, we've got civilization collapse. I second that. Um, ocean levels, life continuing. Life will continue, it's just a question of what life and in what condition. Um, sea level rise, greenhouse gases, inaction, impending catastrophe, heat waves, life as we know it, children, civilization, yes. So this is why climate change matters. It matters for a different reason for all of us, but the thing that most of us care about is we care about this planet we live on because we're not designed to float around in outer space. We care about our children and other people's children who are the future. And we care about our civilization that makes our lifestyles possible. We care because of who we are. And I love the diversity of the reasons that we care here. All right, now you guys know how to use this. You are pros. So now we're gonna get to the questions. Go ahead and write a full question. You don't have to put dots in there or anything like that. Write a full question. And here's the fun part. You don't just have to write a question. You can also upvote somebody else's question. So I'm trying to look at a bunch of different things, but if you've already asked a Q&A question in Zoom, go ahead and put it here too, because if you put it here, then people can upvote it. And what we'll do is we will answer the questions as they come in and we will try to do some upvoting also. But before we do this, while you guys are typing, because I know it takes a while to type and it takes a while to think of your questions, while you're typing your questions in here, I'm going to go to some of the questions that we already got set in ahead of time, answer a couple of those really quickly, and then we'll start answering the questions that have gotten upvoted the most here. So don't just answer your question, but upvote the other ones that you want answered. And you guys are doing great already. I see somebody's figured out the upvote already here. Okay, here we go. Um, in discussing this with my cousin, he said, if those California wildfires were due to climate change, why aren't they happening everywhere else? It's just poor forest management. Well, actually, they don't get as much press when they happen in other places because there isn't as many people or valuable infrastructure at risk. But if we look at the actual data, we can see that the area burned by wildfires across the entire Western United States has doubled as a result of a changing climate. So since 1980, we would have seen about 11 million acres burned by wildfire naturally across the whole Western US. We've seen almost 25 million acres burned because of a changing climate. So not, sorry, 12, 12 to 13 more. Um, your cousin may not be aware that uh, Alaska just had its worst wildfire season on record. Fort McMurray wildfire, which happened three years ago, was the most costly insured disaster in Canada. There are out of control wildfires that raged through Siberia this July and August. So they are happening in other places. They just don't make the headlines as they do in California where there's a lot of people and a lot of infrastructure at risk. All right. Uh, we're getting a lot of good questions here. Let me grab one more off these. Um, ooh, here's one of my um, 
one of my favorites. Uh, what sources would you recommend for people who are interested in resources, including books? I have a lot of great favorite sources. And in fact, if you guys don't mind, you can still keep entering questions here. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some of my favorite sources on the computer because that's a great way to actually see what I'm talking about, right? Okay, here we go. So you won't see the questions, but you can still keep on entering them and upvoting them. And I'm going to take you just for a second here. I'm going to take you to uh, a browser where I'm going to show you um, some of my favorite resources. So first of all, you may already know this resource, but if you don't, Skeptical Science is a fantastic source of information on all the frequently asked questions that people have about climate change. They have gone through and they have ranked all the sciencey sounding myths in order of frequency, from the most frequent to the least frequent. Here's the myth on the left, here's what the science says on the right, and if you click on what the science says, just a second here. They have a short answer at the top. They have a longer answer below with links directly to the scientific literature. And they don't just have a basic, they have an intermediate answer too. So skeptical science is fanta a fantastic resource to answer common questions or objections about climate change. Now, if you're wondering how climate change is gonna affect the places where you live, I would recommend the National Climate Assessment. It has a chapter for every region of the United States, and it has a chapter for every sector. And Brett, if you don't mind, if you could be putting these links maybe in the chat box. Okay, that would be perfect, because then the links will be in the chat box, so you can just click on them or save them. So there's a chapter for every region. There's a chapter for every sector. They have nice short key messages at the top if you don't want to read the whole thing. And if you'd rather watch a video version of these, I have you covered. Our Global Weirding series on YouTube has over 30 short episodes on frequently asked questions and topics. And what we did was we went through the National Climate Assessment and we created a video for every region, including Alaska and the islands. And of course, I had to do one for Canada too, since I'm from Canada. So this is a great resource if you wanna understand what climate change means for you in the places where you live. If you want to know more about climate solutions in addition to pricing carbon, that's a policy solution. If you want to know more about um, ag solutions and energy solutions, Project Drawdown is fantastic. They have a list of 100 solutions that are really creative and innovative. Some of them are kind of standard like um, onshore wind turbines. But then look at number three, reduced food waste. Number four, plant-rich diet. Number six, educating girls. Number 11, regenerative agriculture. I always stumble a little bit over that word. Uh, number 21, clean cook stoves. So this is a great resource for solutions. If you're looking for a book, if you're a reader and you're looking for a book, um, the, the most comprehensive book that's very readable but that covers the science, the impacts, the solutions, and the policy is this one. It's called, actually, this is the older edition. Just a second here. Let me show you the newer edition. Here's the newer edition. The newer edition is called The Thinking Person's Guide to Climate Change. It covers everything. And when you've done it, you'll feel like you finished a university course that was super easy to read. So don't be afraid of that. It's very easy to read, but it's very comprehensive. And one person actually asked a question about a woman's group. Um, is there a book that you would recommend discussing in a group of women? Some are religious, some are not. Our book that I wrote with my husband is currently out of print and I can't reissue it because I'm writing a new book and I'm under contract, which says I'm not allowed to reissue an old book until after it's done. My new book is called Talking Climate. It's about how we have these conversations about climate change. And after it's out, which is coming out this coming year, then I'm going to be re releasing the other book. But I have an Amazon wish list that has tons of great books on it, including books that are Christian. So Amazon, um, let's see, Catherine Hayhoe recommends. Let's see. I think if you search for Catherine recommends, you can find, let's see, idea lists by Catherine Hayhoe. I have to search for my own idea lists. There we go. Um, Climate science policy and solutions. This is a great list of books. Um, I have read, I think I've read all of them. And um, 
there's books on the social science, there's books on the impacts, there's books on the history, which I love. There's books for Christians, like this one over here called Caring for Creation by Paul, um, by Mitch Hescox and Paul Douglas. Somehow they put their two names together into Paul Hescox, <laughs> but it's, it's Mitch and Paul who wrote this book. So if you go to my, my uh, list, you will find all of these books here and you can browse them to your heart's content and see what best fits the purpose that you're looking for. All right, so those are a lot of the questions we got ahead of time. Let us go back and see what we have waiting here for us on the screen. Just a second here, give it a second to sync. Okay, all right, <laughs> here we go. Um, how do we talk to anybody? How do we have a productive conversation with anybody? Well, this is actually what my TED Talk is about. And the answer is you begin with something that you share that you have in common with that person, not something that you disagree with on them. And if you can express appreciation for them and for what they believe about it, even better. How do you do this with a Republican legislator? They're a human too. Yes, they may seem like a special type of human, any politician is, but they are humans too. So when you're talking with a Republican legislator, find out what makes them tick? What do they value? What can you genuinely admire and esteem about them? And if you can't find something, then you're not the right person to have that conversation. Find out what that is and then patiently express appreciation for them. Connect the dots to why, because of what you both care about, you might care about the impacts of a changing climate. And then bring up a practical, viable, bipartisan solution that they could buy into, such as putting a price on carbon. Also things like a just transition, helping communities that depend on fossil fuels for their income, cleaning up the air and the water in the community, growing green jobs, connect the dots to viable practical solutions that the legislator could understand could benefit. So let me share a CCL story with you. You might know this already. And Dave, you might actually be listening. This is a story about you that you told me. So Dave is a retired physician from Utah. And again, he might be on this call. And he was assigned to the Republican head of the Senate in Utah. So Dave went to visit every month. And you know, the first month, what do you do? You get your foot in the door and you leave your card. And then maybe the second time they might sort of recognize you and you get to meet with the 20 year old intern. By the end of the first year, Dave's on, you know, first name basis with the chief of staff. By the second year, after patiently visiting every single month, he says, hey, Catherine Hayhoe is a climate scientist and a Christian. She's coming to town. Would you like to meet with her? And the head of the Utah Senate says, yes, absolutely. Let's get together and have breakfast. Let's talk about climate solutions for Utah. That is the amazing miracle that can be accomplished through appreciation, through directly connecting to other people as human beings, and through emphasizing that what connects us, what we have in common, what we share is far more than what divides us. All right, now on question number two, which has risen to the top there, how to respond to deniers. Okay, let me just be clear here. I don't like using the word denier because that immediately kind of draws a line in the sand. Um, I prefer using a word uh, dismissive. Where does the word dismissive come from? Let me show you. This is why I love doing it on my own computer. Okay, so if you are familiar with the six Americas of global warming. And if you're not familiar, don't worry, I will introduce it to you. The six Americas of global warming is a segmentation. It shows how we're not just, oops, we're not just yes or no, black or white on this issue. We are divided into six groups that kind of span a spectrum. And at one end, we have people who are dismissive. This is a perfect name because a dismissive person will dismiss anything and everything. They will dismiss IPCC reports piled up to the ceiling. They will dismiss the results of 10,000 scientists over 150 years. They would dismiss an angel from God with tablets of stone saying global warming is real in foot high letters of flame. So if they will dismiss all of that, why would we think that we could change their mind? We can't, it takes a miracle. And I do believe miracles happen, and I have seen a few miracles. But 
in most cases, engaging with the nine percenters, that's who they are, nine percent, engaging with the nine percenters like Cranky Uncle is fruitless because it is part of their identity to reject climate change. How do you know if someone's dismissive? Well, they're the person who always brings up climate change. They can't help but bring it up in a negative way all the time. They comment online. They read all the material in the blogs that spread all the false information. And I actually have a test on Twitter for telling if somebody is dismissive or not. Here's the test. If they say something that's not true, and if you respond, I'm sorry that's not true, please update your understanding with this resource, and you give them a resource, like a skeptical science article or a scientific um, article or a global weirding episode, they literally can't click on it. They can't. They will ignore it. They will lie about it and say they did. They will ridicule it. Um, they cannot click a link because they're so afraid that what they might see would challenge who they are that they can't do that. So when I engage with a dismissive person, if it's in a public sphere where there's other people listening, like at the Thanksgiving dinner table where the family's listening or on social media or a questioner at a talk I give, if there's somebody else listening, I briefly respond. I say, no, that's not right. According to the sun, we should be getting cooler right now, not warmer or whatever it is. But then I pivot because the real reason they're bringing this up is not because they actually have a problem with 150 year old science. They don't. They have a problem with what they perceive to be the solutions. They think the only solutions are to uh, destroy the economy, let the government take away their truck, never eat meat again, never fly again, let Chinese or the Antichrist or the United Nations take over the world. They believe that's the only solution to climate change. So I pivot within the same answer to say, and did you know, and I offer a hopeful fact about solutions. Did you know that um, George Schultz and Jim Baker, who you may remember from the Bush era, support a price on carbon as a free market mechanism? Did you know that there's more jobs in the solar energy industry now than there is in the coal industry? Did you know that China has more solar and wind energy than any other country in the world and they are beating the pants off the United States? Are you okay with that cranky uncle? Because I'm not. So, but don't engage with arguing on the science because you're never gonna change their mind on that and you're just um, wasting your energy and your time. And so, our Global Weirding series has a video specifically on this, and I'm gonna show it to you so you know which one it is. The video that's specifically on how to have these conversations is number two here. If I just explain the facts, they'll get it, right? That is how not to talk to Cranky Uncle, that video. All right, let's go back and see what we have here in terms of questions. That probably answered a few questions at the same time, I imagine. All right. Um, what are the most dire consequences of climate change on the horizon? Ooh, that one like snuck up. That one's really good. Uh, climate change is, as the U.S. military calls it, a threat multiplier. That's what it is. It is a threat multiplier that takes all of the other issues we already care about and exacerbates them or amplifies them or makes them worse. Like what? Well, personally, what means the most to me is that climate change is amplifying and exacerbating poverty. A new study that just came out this summer showed that the gap between the richest and the poorest countries has already increased by as much as 25% as a result of a changing climate already, not future, already. It exacerbates hunger and disease and lack of access to clean water. It exacerbates political instability that can lead to refugee crisis. But climate change also affects our health. It affects our safety. It affects our economy. It even affects our jobs. It affects our insurance rates. So what are the most dire consequences of climate change on the near term horizon? It depends on who we are and where we live. My cousin lost his home in the Tubbs wildfire in California, and they were evacuated again in the Kincaid wildfire just a couple of weeks ago. I have many friends and colleagues and acquaintances in Houston who are still trying to recover from the devastation of Hurricane Harvey. I went to school in the Midwest, and I have many friends up there who were horribly impacted by the massive flooding there. So short term, 
The most dire consequences are the way that the extremes that we're already vulnerable to in the places where we live today are being exacerbated or magnified by a changing climate. And for more information on that, again, you can see the National Climate Assessment and you can see those short videos that we made about each region of the US and Canada. But long term, how is it, what's the most dire consequence? The most dire consequence is not the extinction of the human race. I think, and, and most scientists think that that's very unlikely, but what is actually quite likely is the destruction of our civilization. Why? Because our civilization, our infrastructure, our services, our economy, our allocation of water and energy and food and resources, it's all based on the assumption of a stable climate. Because climate has been as stable as the temperature of a human body, which goes up and down by as much as maybe at max one degree Fahrenheit over time, over the course of a day, our climate has been as stable as the temperature of a human body over the development of human civilization. And that is why we have thrived. There have been small ups and downs that have been regional in nature, like the Little Ice Age or the medieval warm period. But our climate has been stable over the course of human civilization, which is not that old, just a matter of several thousands of years old, but now it is changing faster than at any time, as far as we can tell, in millions of years. And our civilization, our infrastructure, our economic systems, our resource systems, our, our political systems are not built to cope with that magnitude of change. And that is why it's so urgent to cut our carbon emissions as much as possible as soon as possible. How do we connect this long-term change to people's daily lives? I love this. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, and keep on going. It's not frozen. You can keep on adding more questions if you want to, or you can keep on upvoting questions. How do we connect it to people's lives? Well, one of the biggest and most dangerous myths that the largest number of us have bought into, in my opinion, is not the myth that the science isn't real or it's just a matter of opinion, although that is dangerous, but the most widespread myth the largest number of people have bought into is that I have to be a certain type of person to care about climate change. If I am an environmentalist, if I'm a tree hugger, if I'm a granola eater, if I'm a Birkenstock wearer, if I'm a liberal, if I'm a Democrat, if I vote green, then of course I care about climate change. But if I'm not that, then I don't care. But here's the reality. The only reason any of us care about climate change is not because of a one or two or three or four degree increase in the average temperature of the planet. If that was the only thing that happened, it wouldn't really matter that much. We care about that because that affects us. It affects everything that is already at the top of our priority list today. So how do we connect this long-term change to people's daily lives? We do exactly that by figuring out what they already care about and then by connecting the dots between are they, do they fish or hunt? Are they birders or skiers? Do they have kids? Are they parents? Do they live in a certain place that's being affected in a certain way? Do they care about the economy or jobs or national security? What is it that they care about? And then we can connect the dots. So let me show you something that I wrote that specifically addresses this question here. Here we go. It is, um, it was actually a cover story I wrote for foreign policy. People already care about climate change. How do you get them to realize it? Um, and so Brett, if you just Google uh, foreign policy and you know, weather weird and hey-ho or something like that, okay, it'll pop right up and you can put it in the window. And this, so this was the cover story for foreign policy two years ago and I wrote this essay and it's all about how do you connect those dots. And I did not see this photo until they published the essay. And when I saw this photo, I could not believe how amazing it was. Because the number one image we see when we think of climate change is usually a polar bear sitting on a piece of ice looking sad. Well, here you've got the ice, but who's on the ice? Us. We're on the ice. And it's the perfect metaphor for why we care about a changing climate. Because after the polar bear, we're next. What climate change impacts are you most worried about? I think that that kind of connects to the first one I answered about dire consequences. Uh, my husband is a geologist. Yes. I know geologists and I have heard exactly this. So here's the thing. His perspective is that of the planet as a whole. Will the planet as a whole over geologic timeframes be okay? Well, the planet itself, yes, it will continue to orbit the sun. 
it will continue to have life of some form on it. It will continue to, this temperature will continue to go up and down controlled by natural cycles once there's no longer any humans on the planet, if that ever happened. But what your husband is forgetting is it's a question of scale. So you know when you look at a scale and you don't see anything happening, but then you zoom in on it and you're like, oh my gosh, there's a lot happening, right? So we humans have only been around for what? Six to 8,000 years our civilization's been around. That's how long we've had agriculture and buildings and infrastructure and roads and uh, political and economic systems. Six to 8,000 years, that's nothing. Geologists don't even look at things over that time scale. So over six to 8,000 years, we have this precious, unique civilization that has grown up in a period of remarkable climate stability. Actually, part of that due to us, because according to ice age cycles, we should be getting cooler right now. And the reason why we weren't getting cooler was because of the development of agriculture and deforestation. So we had just about perfectly leveled off climate for ourselves by accident when along came the Industrial Revolution. So our global weirding episode called Isn't This Just a Natural Cycle? That's the one that goes through all of the natural factors. Often geologists don't realize that we climate scientists study the natural factors too. We look at orbital cycles, we look at geologic activity, we look at changes in energy from the sun, we look at volcanoes, we look at all of the natural factors, and we show that according to that, we should be getting cooler right now and we're not, we're warming. So we know it is us, and the reason it's a big deal is not because of the planet, it's because of us humans. We don't exist in geologic time. We exist in a very narrow, short window of ideal conditions. And the faster we move out of those ideal conditions, the more dangerous it is for us. That's the difference. Okay. Um, do we need nuclear power? Ooh, great question. So I am not an energy expert or an economist, but what I can say is this. Um, I don't think we should be throwing out anything right now because priority number one is cutting carbon and nuclear energy doesn't produce carbon. Now, why don't we have more nuclear energy? Well, people will tell you a lot of reasons, but there's only one reason. It's expensive. Nuclear energy is currently the most expensive form of electricity you could possibly build in the world at this time. And in a world where wind and sun are already cheaper than coal in all the country, and they're already cheaper than natural gas in large parts of the country, why would you use the most expensive source of energy to get new energy? But, two buts here. First of all, if nuclear is already running and it's located in a safe place, not like on the coast where you're gonna have a tsunami on it or something like that, then it is affordable to keep it running. Why not? Number two, nuclear provides baseload power. So you know the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. I'm always surprised that people feel it necessary to tell me that. Uh, and batteries and storage are making tremendous advances to help balance that out. But for a given power grid, it's good to have a baseload constant supply of power and both um, and nuclear can do that. So it's a good thing for the grid to have that baseload power. Now, did you know that there's a new type of nuclear power being developed called micro nuclear? It's small modular reactors the size of a tractor trailer. You can put as many of them together as you want, so they're much more flexible and potentially much cheaper. And they're a fast breeder reactor, so they do not produce waste. I mean, does that not just blow your mind? So they're test, they developed it at Idaho National Labs. They're testing it out at New Scale, which is a company in Oregon. And here's the bottom line to this. When many people who aren't on board with climate solutions or climate change find out that, hey, you know what? Nuclear maybe could be part of the solution depending on what, where, and how. That is what they need to do in about face because nuclear is deeply rooted in certain people's emotions or psyche. It's a symbol of the Cold War era. It's a symbol of American exceptionalism and greatness. Nuclear power is symbolic to a lot of people. And so by saying, well, there could be room for nuclear in the fold, as Project Drawdown does, then we're actually allowing more people into the tent. Will we actually end up using it or not? That totally depends on the market. Really, it's a market question. You and I aren't gonna decide that. 
But by allowing it to be considered, we are creating a bigger tent that will bring more people in to talk about climate solutions. And that's the most important reason why I think my answer to number two is yes. Great. And what I want to, you, to remind you of too, um, you, you guys might already know this, but I just wanna remind you of this again. Um, we are also simultaneously doing an AMA on Reddit. So if you go to Reddit and let's see, Brett, you've got the address here, right? Yeah, I'll put it in the chat. Okay, um, I think it's here, is this it? Yes, so we've got this up on Reddit and I'm gonna be answering these Reddit questions later. So if you feel like there's something that I didn't answer or you're like, hey, we had a great chat with Catherine Hayho, too bad you couldn't come and the person you're talking to is like, oh, well, I have a question. They could post it tonight or even tomorrow morning and I will see these questions. You can see we've got 29 questions already here and let's just see what the top one is. Ooh. The top one is, how do you reach out to evangelicals? And I have the answer to that. In fact, the answer to that is our most popular global weirding episode. The most people have watched it. It is called, let me get it for you here. Just a second. It is called, um, here it is, popular uploads. The Bible doesn't talk about climate change, right? So that is specifically on how to talk to Christians, not just Catholics and Protestants, but evangelicals too, about climate change. All right, let's go back now to the questions um, that you guys have been putting into poll EV. Okay. All right, where are we at now? Um, oh, is extraction of CO2 from the atmosphere a practical solution? Well, um, here's the thing. We have a certain amount of carbon we can produce in order to remain below a certain temperature target. So there's no magic number. You know, if we end up at 1.499 degrees, we're all okay, but if we're at 1.501 degrees, we're all screwed. That's not true. It's kind of like saying there's no magic number of cigarettes you can smoke before the damage occurs, but we do know that the more cigarettes you smoke, the more damage occurs, right? So there's a certain amount of carbon we can produce to remain below each different temperature level, and that carbon is the sum of what we produce and what we take up. So the more carbon we draw down, that offsets more of our emissions. And right now our emissions are increasing. So I am like full speed ahead with the drawdown people, not as a solution, but as an accompaniment to it. You know what I mean? So if we just tried to do drawdown without reducing our carbon emissions, that would be ridiculous. We can't do that. There's no way we could do it. It wouldn't fix anything because the, the magnitude is way off. Like we can draw down this much and we're producing this much. But if we reduce what we can and if we draw down some, that helps us. It gives us that extra boost. So it's sort of like, this is sort of a bad analogy, but it's like you trained as hard as you could, you're running as fast as you can, and then somebody gives you an energy shot and that's just like the extra bit you need it to make it over the finish line. That extra energy shot is like drawdown. So what is drawdown? Drawdown is the process of taking carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it preferably into the biosphere or into the soils where we want it. Because carbon in the biosphere in the soil is a good thing. Carbon in the soil is like miracle grow on steroids. Did you know that? So ways to draw down carbon range from extremely low tech to extremely high tech. What's a low way or low tech way of drawing down carbon? Tree planting. Yeah, planting trees draws down carbon. Another low tech way is no-till agriculture, permaculture, biochar. Biochar is where you take agricultural residue and instead of letting it just decay or instead of burning it, which releases the carbon into the atmosphere, because you know our life forms are carbon-based, instead you take the agricultural waste and you pyrolyze it. Pyrolyze means you burn it um, in, in a contained chamber under very high temperature and it produces a lot of byproducts, including some useful oils and a fine grainy dark gray powder that is the carbon. The carbon is separated by pyrolyzation into a fine grainy black powder, which is called biochar, which you can then plow back into the soil where it is an incredible fertilizer. And you know what? Native people in the Amazon have been doing it for centuries. So those are kind of the lower tech ways, very beneficial, high tech ways of drawing down carbon. 
Uh, there's a company called Cleanworks and another one called Carbon Engineering that can suck carbon out of the atmosphere and turn it into products. They can turn it into stone that you can use to build. They can even turn it into liquid fuel. Another thing you can do is grow algae. Algae takes carbon out of the atmosphere as it grows, and then you can take the algae and you can turn it into liquid fuel, which we need for many purposes, including jet fuel. United Airlines has been running flights out of the LA airport on biofuel for the last couple of years already. Isn't that amazing? Hardly anybody knows that. All right, so where are we at now in terms of questions? Is there any way to slow down the release of methane from the Arctic? Well, there's actually a company um, that is creating these cooling tubes that you can put into the permafrost to basically air condition the permafrost and keep it frozen rather than thawing. But these tubes are very expensive. You can't just put them all over the entire Arctic. So who are they being used by? Cue the irony. They're being used by oil and gas companies to cool the land around their pipelines. So the permafrost under the pipelines won't thaw. They are also being used in villages and around homes and other buildings that can afford them. But um, the best way to slow the release of methane from the Arctic is to reduce and eventually eliminate our carbon emissions. All right. Um, what are the most compelling ways to convince people that climate change is real, man-made, and worth addressing now? Well, so this is actually addressed by the global weirding episode I just showed you. If I just tell them the facts, they'll change their mind. But let me get into it a little bit more and encourage you to go back and watch that episode too. So when we bring up the issue of climate change with people who don't agree, people who are sort of on the right-hand side of that six Americas spectrum that I showed you, they will throw up science-y sounding objections, like it's just the sun or volcanoes or a natural cycle. They will also often throw up religiously sounding objections, like, oh, God is in control, or the world's going to end anyways. I call them E objections because they aren't really scientific, and they're not really religious either. The Bible says exactly the opposite. It says God gave humans responsibility over every living thing on this planet. Genesis 1, chapter 1. Uh, and then, if you look at science, we know that according to natural factors, we should be cooling right now, not warming. But do they really have a genuine problem with physics that we've known since the 1850s? No, because if they did, they wouldn't be using refrigerators or stoves or airplanes or any other piece of modern technology that uses the same physics. What is the real problem? The real problem in 99.9% .9 of the cases, there's always an occasional person who thinks they know better than 150 years of physics, but 99.9% .9 of the time, the real problem is solution aversion. They believe, and frankly, many of us believe, that the only solutions to climate change are punitive, harmful, painful, uncomfortable, negative, lead to a lower quality of life, reduce our personal freedom. And so, because we see the only viable, plausible solutions as negative, now, they aren't really negative, actually. Climate solutions will give us cleaner air, cleaner water, more jobs, greater security, <laughs> more efficient resources, more equity. But because we've been told, we've been deliberately told, you can hear politicians telling people this all the time, we've been told the only solutions are negative. And in fact, you know what I've heard recently in conservative Christian circles, you know what they're saying? They're saying the only solution they're proposing to climate change is abortion. That's what they're saying, literally, that the only solution is abortion. And so, of course, you can never endorse that solution if you're pro-choice. Anyways, but here's the thing. If we say it's a real problem and it's really affecting people, not me but other people, but I don't want to fix it, that makes us the bad person. And we don't want to be the bad guy. We want to be the good guy, right? So our natural and really our subconscious defense mechanism is to throw up objections to the real problem. It's not real. It's not us. It's okay. It's not that bad. We're, we don't make much of a difference compared to China or some other group. We throw up these objections as our defense mechanism or our smoke screen to the real problem, which is that we don't think there's viable solutions that are consistent and compatible with our values. So what is the most compelling way to convince people that the science is real? 
to show them a solution they can agree with. I know that sounds a bit counterintuitive, but that's it. And let me tell you a story about John Cook. So John Cook is the creator of Skeptical Science. He created that website. He became one of the premier myth busters on sciencey sounding myths in the entire world because of his father. Every time he'd go home for dinner, you know, his father would be like, well, John, I heard there's more polar bears in the Arctic now than there ever have been. And John would be like, no, dad. And he'd show him all the data. And then he'd go home again. His dad would be like, well, John, I heard one volcano produces more CO2 than all the whole world does. It's like, no, that's actually not true. So he created this premier website for debunking sciencey sounding myths and became a national and a global leader in science disinformation. Did that convince his father? No. But then where his father lives in Australia, they were offering a rebate on solar panels. So his father's identity is that of a shrewd fiscal conservative. So he crunched the numbers. He figured out how much money he would save that these idiots were gonna offer him. I'm just paraphrasing here. Uh, and he got solar panels and he started to save a ton of money. And then he went around telling people how much money he was saving. And those solar panels were reinforcing his identity as a shrewd fiscal conservative. So all of a sudden, there was a solution that he was totally on board with, not only on board with, but it was making him look even better at what he wanted to be good at. So then he said to John, and this just happened fairly recently, he's like, well, John, you know, that whole global warming thing, it might actually be real. But I've got my solar panels. I'm doing my part. That's what convinced him. Isn't that amazing? All right. I think we have time for um, a couple more probably. Brett, what do you think? We are just grateful for your time. So I know we, uh, we promised uh, not to take up any more than the top of your hour. So maybe uh, another 12 minutes or so. Okay, we can do it. All right. Um, what is the most meaningful and impactful action that each one of us can take now? Well, this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart because this is what my TED talk is about. The most important action we can do is talk about it. Why? Because nobody does. And if nobody talks about it, why would we care? And if nobody cares, why would we ever do anything about it? So talking about it, number one, joining an organization that amplifies your voice with like-minded people who we can act together with for hope. Number two, that's what CCL is all about. Voting and talking to our leaders, our elected officials, our legislators, the people in charge at our business, our church, our school, our organization, our city, our institution. Reducing our own carbon footprint, stepping on the carbon scales, and then telling people about it so that they see that there are viable solutions. From reducing food waste to, sure, there's solar panels now, here's how much they cost, I'll help you do the math to see if it's worth it for you or not. Talking about climate change is one of the most important things we can do. And I want to share with you my favorite maps here because it brings the point home in spades. So I don't know if you've seen the Yale climate opinion maps, but they're really good. Here we go. I think they actually update them to 2019. Yes, they did. Okay. The Yale climate opinion maps are fantastic. They have them for the United States and Canada. They have them by congressional district and by county. So it is a fantastic resource to take in to your legislator when you're having a conversation because you can show them what people in their district actually think. Okay. So Yale Climate Opinion Maps 2019, and Brett, I think you just put the link right there so people can click on it. So is global warming happening? Most people say yes. Now pay attention here because I'm gonna take you through these maps to tell a story, okay? Will global warming harm plants and animals? Well, even if you don't think it's happening, you think it will harm plants and animals. <laughs> so people might say, oh, I don't think it's happening, but if it was, it would harm plants and animals, okay. Will global warming harm future generations? Um, slightly lighter orange, but mostly yes. So anything orange is more than 50%, and anything that's blue is less than 50%. Will global warming harm people in developing countries? There's a little bit more blue there, but still mostly orange. Will global warming harm people in the United States? There's more blue here, but here's the interesting thing. If you compare this map, do you, do you think humans are causing global warming? This map is, do you think humans are causing global warming? And again, if you want a congressional district, you just click here and you can see congressional districts. 
But do you think it is harming people, will harm people in the US? It looks like this. Okay. So we're still at 57% of people thinking it will harm people in the US. But here's the kicker. Ready? Do you think it will harm you personally? Look at that. It is dark blue, except where? Except in areas with large Hispanic Catholic populations who are very concerned about climate change and large Native American populations who are also concerned about climate change. Isn't that interesting? So what do we talk about when we talk about climate change? We don't have to talk about the science stuff. We have to talk about why it matters to us. The National Climate Assessment, the Global Weirding Episodes, why does climate change matter to us in the places where we live? Now, you might think this is the darkest blue map, but there's one more darker blue map, and the darker blue map is, do you discuss global warming at least occasionally? No, nobody does. So doesn't this explain it? If you never talk about it, why would you care? If you, never, if you don't care, why would you ever want to act? So the most important single thing anybody can do is talk about it. Talk about how it affects us in the places where we live and what are some practical, viable solutions that we can all engage in at every level, from the individual choices to regional or collective choices to policy choices and technology choices. What are, can we do to fix this? Now, I don't want to leave this map on this depressing note because these maps also show some incredibly good news. Ready? It asks people about solutions. Do you support funding research into renewable energy? Look at that. Dark red across the whole country. Do you support um, requiring fossil fuel companies to pay a carbon tax, which is a form of fee and dividend? Look at that. It's darker orange than almost any question we asked. There is widespread agreement. And so you can look at a congressional district and you can, oh my gosh, every congressional district is orange. So you can go into any Republican legislator, no matter where you live in the whole United States, and you can say, did you know that there is a majority support for fee and dividend or for carbon pricing in our district? This is what you can take to your legislator. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? They asked about other questions too, like, do you think um, schools should teach more about global warming? Yes, they do. Um, and I have a PhD student who just finished his dis dissertation on teachers. And you know what he found? He found that the measure of whether teachers teach about climate change in their classrooms where they never have enough time and they never have enough resources is whether the teachers feel a sense of personal efficacy. So whether the teachers feel like there are viable solutions that by teaching the kids about this, they're not just teaching the kids to despair, they're teaching the kids that there are solutions. So if you are a parent, if you know a teacher, encourage them and build up their sense of personal efficacy because the best predictor of whether the teacher teaches the kids is whether the teacher feels like we can fix this. And then there was a study that was done in North Carolina this past spring where they educated children about climate change in North Carolina and then they tested their parents before and after. Children successfully changed the mind of their parents. The conservative parents changed the most and daughters were most effective at changing their conservative dad's minds. How amazing is that? So when we have these conversations about climate change, I wanna show you one last thing here. You might say, well, I'm not a scientist. So, you know, Catherine, maybe you could come and talk to people, but I'm not a scientist, so I just don't feel qualified to talk about it. Well, let me tell you, there is research on, and Brett, if you go to climate, it's the climatechat.org slash messengers here. There's research on who the best messengers are on climate change. And I want to share this with you. Who is the best messenger? Drum roll, please. Friends and family are the best messengers. Friends and family are the most trusted messengers that can create the greatest change. And we are all friends or family. Number two is scientists. And I was really surprised when I pulled up this page the first time because I didn't know I was there. Um, number three, weather reporters, broadcast meteorologists. Number four, healthcare professionals. So if you're a healthcare professional, you have a special role here. 
Uh, military, if, have you been in the military? You have a special role. Are you in business? Are you a business person? You've got a special role too. Religious leaders are down here. They're not anywhere even near the top. Sorry, Pope. This isn't the Pope. Who is this actually? Not quite sure. Anyways, um, then we've got journalists, politicians, <laughs> and celebrities. They're down at the bottom. So no worries. You, you are the most effective messenger about a changing climate. So I want to go back here and I want to just close with this. This is my final question to you. I want your answer here. Ready? What keeps us moving forward is hope, rational hope. What gives you hope? If you need to use more than two words, one word, use a dot, right? Use a dot between two words. What gives you hope? What keeps you moving forward? Yes, other people. Being part of a group of like-minded people that are acting, that gives us hope. What else gives you hope? Yes, community, people, engaging with each other. And what are we doing when we're having conversations? We are engaging with each other. So talking about climate change doesn't just influence other people. It's part of a positive feedback loop that influences us too and gives us hope. What do we have here? Humans are amazing. My grandchildren, um, my, my, my grandkids, um, human compassion, community, ice cream. I like that too. <laughs> technology. I do like technology too. Young people. Um, actions, miracles, knowing that I'm not in control. Yes, it is not up to us. We do what we can. We walk in the good works that have been provided for us in advance, and we let the chips fall where they may after we have done everything we could. So that hope comes from people. So remember that when you're tempted to disengage with people, don't. Engage. Seek out like-minded people. Have conversations with people who agree with you as well as with people who don't agree with you. Have conversations about what we're doing, about what other people are doing. Have conversations about what gives us hope. So future resources. Don't forget our Global Weirding series. I also have an article that I wrote for a Canadian magazine, a Canadian woman's magazine called How to Talk About Climate Change So People Will Listen. Um, Brett, if you Google Chatelaine Magazine and my name and this title, this should pop right up. And you can put it in the window there. It's Chatelaine Magazine, how to talk about climate change so people will listen. And I tell some stories here. Then there's my TED Talk. Please give my TED Talk a watch. It has a little bit of what we talked about today, but it has a lot more other stuff. It has been translated into, I think, 18 languages, and it is almost at 2 million views. So please share it with anybody who speaks any of these languages and have that conversation today because that is the single most important thing we can do, even with fellow Christians, because the title of this um, Q&A and AMA comes from this article that I wrote for the New York Times on last month called, I'm a climate scientist who believes in God, hear me out. Why do I care about climate change? Because it is unfair. It hits the hardest against the people who are poor and vulnerable in this world. So this is what the whole Q&A was called. Uh, this is what I wrote about what I care, but each of us has different reasons why we care. And when we figure out what those are and what we share with other people, we can have those conversations together. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Citizens Climate Lobby's training program. You can tune into more episodes anywhere podcasts are available. Inspired by what you heard today? Join Citizens Climate Lobby to advocate for bipartisan climate solutions. Go to community.citizensclimate.org to find more trainings, resources, your local chapter, national action teams, discussion forums, and more. Be sure to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Citizens Climate. We also invite all of our listeners to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more inspiration. And together, we are creating the political will for a livable world.